Access denied. The U.S. seizes media websites linked to Iran. Tehran calls it a breach of press freedom. So why is this happening now? And could it set a dangerous precedent for global censorship? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mohammed Jamjoum. Like many nations, Iran has media outlets broadcasting news to the world through that country's perspective. But the United States has accused Tehran of using them to spread misinformation. The U.S. Justice Department seized 33 sites linked to Iran's state media, such as the English language press TV and a channel used by Yemen's Houthi rebels. It also blocked three websites operated by Kataib Hezbollah, an Iranian-backed group in Iraq. But some of the pages were soon back online under a different web address. Tehran accused Washington of double standards. What the U.S. did to Iranian websites was a breach of all principles of freedom of speech, which the United States is proud of. They restricted freedom of speech. We condemn this measure. We will use all our legal and international means to counter this wrong policy of the United States. It is not a constructive move at a time when nuclear talks are underway in Vienna. The seizures are happening at a sensitive time between the two nations. Iran had just elected a new president. Ibrahim Raisi has already ruled out meeting President Joe Biden. And in Vienna, diplomats from the U.S., Europe, China, Russia and Iran have held six rounds of talks to revive the 2015 nuclear deal. Negotiators say they're close to a breakthrough. All right, let's bring in our guests. In Tehran, Hamid Musavi is professor of political science at Tehran University. In Washington, D.C., Courtney Radsch is a contributor at Tech Policy Press. And in Birmingham, Scott Lucas is an emeritus professor of international politics at University of Birmingham. A warm welcome to you all. Hamid, let me start with you today. These seizures, they've come at a really critical and delicate time, a time when U.S. and Iranian officials are trying to revive the 2015 nuclear deal. How strange is the timing of this to you, and do you believe that it has the possibility to derail the negotiations? Well, I mean, it's definitely not a good sign. It doesn't show any goodwill by the Americans. Uh, also, it's interesting to note that Press TV had been reporting very critically of the negotiations in the past month. In fact, the very same day that it was seized, it broke an exclusive news story um, with sources close to the negotiations, saying that the American team was not very flexible in the talks, and it had been doing so repeatedly in the past month. So I think the fact that it was seized uh, during this very sensitive time might actually complicate the process of reaching a deal between Iran and the U.S. Scott, from your vantage point, yep. what do you think about the timing? I mean, is this strange? And, and also, what does the U.S. gain by doing this right now? Uh, could it be seen simply as a political tool to have more leverage in the negotiations going forward? I don't think there's a direct connection between the Biden administration's tactics and the seizures. I think it might sound a bit strange, but you effectively have two tracks in American policy. You have the policy right now, which of course is, is to go into the nuclear talks in Vienna, which are very close to a resolution, according to the Iranians, including U.S. reentry to the deal, lifting of American sanctions, and Iran return to compliance. On the other hand, you've got a track in American policy, which has been there for years and was ramped up by the Trump administration, which is imposing sanctions. And those sanctions include, for example, pressure on any Iranian entity which is using a U.S. service uh, or a U.S. outlet, which is what the Internet domains are. And so I think the Treasury in this case simply was pursuing its own bureaucratic path. Last October, it uh, seized almost 100 sites linked to Iran's Revolutionary Guards, and they simply moved up and then on their bureaucratic path said, OK, now we're going to take sites linked to what they call, quote, disinformation whether it be Iranian state outlets, states linked to Yemen's Houthis, or to allies such as Iraq's Hatib Hezbollah. That said, I agree with uh, uh, Professor Musavi, it's counterproductive. It's counterproductive 
because it, it doesn't deal with any issues that are there in the nuclear talks. I think, in fact, uh, it could undermine them. It doesn't deal with regional issues, and it doesn't deal with the real issues that are there about Iranian politics and dissent. For example, whether you talk about Iran's own censorship of websites, mm. uh, the engineering of the presidential election last week, or indeed its detention of Iranian journalists. Courtney, in the realm of information warfare, how significant is it what the U.S. has done here with these seizures? And from your perspective, does this set a new and more dangerous precedent when it comes to global censorship? Well, I think this is the latest salvo in the information warfare that's been happening kind of around the world as states are seeing new ways to exert their foreign policy priorities through internet governance. And what we're seeing is with the seizure of the domain name system, you know, the, these websites that they're... The U.S. is trying to convey its power and its foreign policy priorities. But I think that one of the things that um, we should also be thinking about is the fact that these you know, so-called news websites or propaganda websites were aiming at uh, providing information related to the nuclear talks. And the U.S. is not only concerned about Iran, it's also concerned about domestic perception of engagement with Iran and about re-entering the nuclear deal. So I think it might be a little bit more complex. We don't know, you know whether these are separate tracks or whether they're related. But in terms of censorship, we should, I think, be concerned when these types of approaches are taken and turning the DNS, the domain name system, into a tool of geopolitical information warfare because that threatens the integrity of the internet and uh, the global network that is the World Wide Web. So we want to be very careful about this. Scott, I saw you nodding along to some of what Courtney was saying there. Did you want to jump in? I think Dr. Ash is absolutely spot on, and that is the wider issue here beyond the U.S. and Iran is the precedent this sets. Okay, fine. The U.S. happens to be able, because the domains are registered in the U.S., to exert pressure on Iran. Uh, does it do so with other countries, not only China or Russia, if they're perceived to be American foes, you know, it could do so with France, Germany, with the UK. Uh, do other countries who happen to have uh, websites registered with them, do they now exert pressure on them as well? You know, the thing about taking a step like this is, is once you open up the door that a state can sort of bring the hammer down on access to the internet, you know, whether it be by state entities or non-state entities, you can't close that door. I think this really cries out for something we can address perhaps in a separate program, mm. which is the need for international cooperation over regulation of the Internet. Hamid, do you believe that this opens up a new front in the global information war? And do you think that this has made things um, you know, more dangerous? Has this escalated things? I think it's definitely a very, very dangerous move, uh, something probably we could have expected from the Trump administration, uh, but not from the Biden administration, which presents itself as a supporter of democracy and freedom of expression. Now, with regards to the accusation of misinformation, the issue here is who gets to decide what is information and what is misinformation. If a government, any government, including the Iranian government or the U.S. government does this, then it's simply the censure of the internet. And the internet is somewhere where people could express themselves freely. It's been like this forever. And with regards to these news sites, I mean, especially with Press TV and Al Alam, these are two uh, professional news channels with hundreds of people working in them. And when you censor them, it essentially sends a very bad signal even to the Iranian people, because on the one hand, you're e always talking about freedom of expression, having a variety of voices. But at the same time, if you censor uh, voices that you don't like, then that would simply be completely wrong. And again, it opens the door for a very dangerous path, I think. Courtney, if the rationale behind this is to counter disinformation, you know, you have to look at what happens next, which is that, you know, a lot of these websites, if they've been seized, if the domains have been seized, and the websites have been shut down. I mean, aren't the Iranians, if they haven't already, just going to be moving them to other domains and starting new websites that are accessible to everybody? There was the example of Forest News Agency in 2018. Um, you know, that was seized, that was shut down, and then it moved to a new domain. It was back online soon afterwards. So how does this move actually help counter disinformation? 
Uh, that's exactly the point, right? This is not the same level of censorship that we see in Iran, where it has, you know, blanket blocks in its country um, against, you know, the entire internet and, and portions of it, and has created kind of an internal intranet. Um, but this is an effort to deny Iran access to U.S. services and to easily reaching U.S. audiences. The IP address still exists. Those websites still exist. They're just not hosted on an American-based domain name server. So the same thing, this is not new. The same thing happened with WikiLeaks over a decade ago. Um, the same approach was proposed in a law in the U.S. that would allow the U.S. to do the same thing for uh, sites that regularly host copyright infringing material. But what we see with this is this expands how this DNS approach is used. But the fact is, you also have to ask, does Iran have a right to use all of these um, expressive services, whether we're talking about domain name service, Twitter accounts, Facebook accounts, to reach uh, the global public to convey its messages while it denies the same rights internally, forcing its own population to use uh, virtual public network VPNs, virtual private networks, um, or other anti you know other circumvention technologies. And meanwhile, like let's not forget that denying the ability of a U.S. domain name service provider to host an Iranian uh, website is a far cry from the censorship that Iran uh, has with at least 15 journalists in jail, uh, the murder of a journalist, um, the assassination uh, by the state, and you know overt uh, rampant censorship. So I think we also need to be careful about kind of false equivalency here. Scott, if I might, I'd like to ask you another question with regard to the, the timing of this move by the U.S., because this comes just days after Ibrahim Raisi was elected president uh, in Iran. He's the incoming president. The U.S. has accused him of human rights abuses. They've imposed sanctions on him in the past. Should this in any way be construed as a message to him and his incoming administration? I, again, I think, as, as Dr. Raj pointed out, you know, we're, we don't know whether the two tracks that I referred to earlier are linked in any way. Uh, I'd be surprised if these were meant to be a message to Raisi for a couple of reasons. First of all, look, Raisi is there as effectively as a spokesperson for the Supreme Leader. Uh, he, his manufactured election was very much because he was the favorite of the Supreme Leader's office. All other candidates that could have defeated him in the election were banned, were actually blocked by the Guardian Council. You know, so if there's a message being sent here, it wouldn't be to Raisi, it would be to the Supreme Leader's office. And I don't think that the Supreme Leader's office is going to be that concerned about the seizure of the domains of these sites. Because again, as you've noted, the sites continue to operate. And if anything, it gives Iran, I think, an, uh, sort of an unwitting propaganda victory here, because they can claim to be the victim of the, of the awful Americans who are trying to oppress them and suppress their freedoms. When in fact, again, as Dr. Rash pointed out, you know, Iran has been basically not only uh, censoring, they've been doing so on a mass scale. And indeed, if we were to talk about press TV, you know, I read press TV every day. Uh, I read it every day to try to understand what is going on from the perspective of the Iranian state. Um, and also to really track what has happened, which is that since the 2009 mass protest over the disputed elections in Iran, uh, Press TV has been curbed, sharply curbed in what it can report and how it reports it. In other words, the guidelines are much stricter on it. If you try to shut down Press TV completely, we don't get smart about what is happening with not only with Press TV, but with other sites. And that limits our opportunity for an informed dialogue between you and I and as part of the international community. Hamid, what about those criticisms of Iran from various governments and various right groups who say, you know, Iran doesn't really have a way to credibly go after the U.S. for this uh, in a country where there is so much censorship um, that, you know, they cannot cry foul right now because of these moves that have been taken by the U.S.? I think it's very true that probably the Iranian government won't be able to do anything. Uh, but the fact that the Iranian government censors the Internet doesn't make this OK. I mean, Internet censorship is wrong anywhere. So if the Iranian government does, does it, it's wrong. It's the same with the American government. Also, we have to remember that these were news websites with political messages. They weren't involved in any sort of terrorism or drug trafficking or pornography or anything like that. 
so the fact that you're actually censoring a political message is, I think, is a very bad move. At the same time, we have to remember that there is a significant power difference here. The Americans have a vast uh, array of resources and capacity regarding the internet. Now, these domains were dot-com domains, and essentially seizing them has blocked access all over the world, not just within the United States. And that's different from the Iranian government. So the U.S. government is essentially censoring these websites all over the world, not just within the United States. And I think it opens, again, a door to maybe a bleak future if they continue to do this with other countries as well. Uh, Courtney, Iranian officials have said that they're going to pursue this through legal channels. Um, are there legal options available to them with regard to this? I think that's a great question, because one of the things we saw um, several years ago is that ICANN, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, which used to be, you know, U.S., uh, the U.S. used to have control over kind of the whole domain system. Well, they've really devolved uh, authority over that. They've created several, you know, many hundreds of new top-level domain names. So PressTV.ir, which is hosted in Iran, still accessible. Um, you know, it's correct that now .com, .net, these uh, high top-level domain names that are hosted uh, and run by U.S. registries and U.S.-based services are being told that providing a service to Iran counteracts the sanctions and um, that these services did not effectively register under the Foreign Agents Registration Act, known as FARA. So I think this is a lot more complicated because the U.S. is trying to frame this not as a speech thing because they haven't actually censored the content. They've censored, you know, one specific way of getting to that content. And they've put pressure on the services providing, you know, that provide those services to Iran saying, you know, this is not acceptable. I think we have to, you know, this also raises questions about other platforms that allow Iran and, and Iranian leaders who may be on sanctions list access to their services to create accounts, et cetera. So whether or not this represents a massive escalation or you know, kind of a one-off um, salvo, I, I think remains to be seen. But it certainly raises questions about whether a lot more services are going to be deciding whether they need to register as a foreign agent, whether they need to make it clear um, that they can't provide these services. And we don't know that yet. We don't know if the Treasury Department is going to pursue that or if these private companies will decide that they're that to be in compliance, they're going to have to deny the service. And that would represent a significant escalation in the information war. Scott, I saw you reacting to some of what Courtney was saying. Did you want to expand on the point she was making? Right. I, I think, in other words, Courtney is absolutely right that, you know, just simply as it were a blanket ban, uh, even if you're supposedly enforcing sanctions information, really isn't going to, I think, work. And I think it will raise, in fact, wider international attention to this on how to deal with it. I think there's an interesting parallel, which I'll put out to you. I'd like to hear the reaction of the other guests on this. And that is, when we have had disinformation, and Press TV does put out disinformation at times, it's not a, the majority of information on its site, but it, it, there is some. But when, for example, you've had Russian outlets, such as RT, that have put out uh, disinformation, they have lost their license to operate in certain countries as a broadcaster. Indeed, Press TV has lost its license to operate in the United Kingdom as a broadcaster, because, supposedly because of some disinformation. I think that question of whether there will be a system of licensing that will be adopted by various states, which will not be, as it were, this blanket sweeping ban, but as it were, targeting certain sites if they're found to be pernicious in disinformation, misinformation, and propaganda, that may be the next phase of what we're looking at, not only in terms of broadcast, but in terms of what is available. On Hamid, it looked to me like you might have wanted to add to what uh, Scott was saying there. Did you want to jump in as well? Yes, so I think uh, the fact that the .ir domain is uh, still operating, I don't think it's going to fix the issue because uh, the .ir domain is not well known anywhere in the world. People know the .com and .net uh, domain. And uh, this is actually not a censor of just uh, some contents of the Press TV website. It's essentially shutting it down for the international audience. Now, when we're talking about misinformation and disinformation from outlets such as RT or other outlets, 
uh, if there is like a unbiased international organization decided, then perhaps that could work. But when it's an actual government doing this, I think uh, that is propaganda in itself because you're actually shutting down the voices you don't like, whereas freedom of expression means tolerating voices you don't like. Um, what is it that these websites are saying that is so wrong? Uh, I think people should be uh, able to access the information they like, especially when it comes to the Internet, which is actually freed uh, access to news and access to information for people all over the world. Uh, so the Biden administration can't talk about democracy and freedom of expression in countries such as Iran and then censoring uh, voices within Iran that it doesn't like. Uh, it's definitely a double standard. Courtney, I mean, trying to counter disinformation and misinformation is so difficult in, in this day and age. I mean, is there a more effective way to do it? I mean, who, who does ultimately get to be the arbiter of this? And are there actual concrete steps that can be taken, you know, to really effectively counter the problem? I mean, I think that is the million dollar question that the world is trying to figure out. I mean, one of the things that this whole incident illustrates, again, is the need for a pluralistic, you know, environment of DNS providers, of social media platforms, of um, places where these things are hosted. Because the fact is, yes, .com and .net are more well-known, um, but the whole reason of creating new top-level domains and now doing that in local languages, et cetera, is to make that more uh, accessible, to, to widen up the array of um, entities that can uh, have these, these you know, domain name services, who can provide these services. So. I think it just emphasizes the need that we need pluralism. You know, if, if, for example, when Trump gets kicked off Facebook, you know, cries of censorship, if Facebook wasn't a three billion person company with massive profits, maybe we wouldn't be so worried about getting kicked off of one platform. So it's really about the, I think, the, the power of, you know, certain platforms that have this outsized influence in the internet regulatory um, sphere. But in terms of combating disinformation, I mean, let's let's be clear. Iran is engaged in disinformation targeting the U.S. to undermine its democracy and an electoral process. That's why you saw several social media platforms kick off uh, accounts and content that were trying to spread disinformation and mm -hmm. undermine U.S. election mm -hmm. last year. And then also, you know, there, the Iranian um, news organizations and state accounts are using, are targeting journalists, Iranian journalists, who are trying to report freely and independently on the country. Think about the BBC, think about my former colleague Yegene Rezaian, mm -hmm. Jason Rezaian. They are targeting them with disinformation, online harassment campaigns. So these are not just neutral reporting, you know, on truth, on truth, or you know, whatever is happening uh, with the latest developments in the nuclear mm. talks. They are also engaged in information warfare that are also targeting Iranian right. citizens. Uh, Scott, we've only got about a minute left. Let me just ask you very simply. I mean, where does all this leave the U.S. and Iranian relationship at the moment? I mean, is it is it as bad as it has been for a long time? Is there any 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 possibility uh, that it gets better? No, I think in the short term, where the rubber hits the road is those nuclear talks in Vienna. Uh, the sixth round ended last weekend. When it did, not only the Iranians, but the European Union pointed to the idea that in the next round of talks, which should take place in the next couple of weeks, there might be a deal. And if there's a deal, you know, all these ripples, including what we're talking about today, they'll be superseded by this opening. All right, we've got the nuclear deal, but that's when it gets, again, complicated, because beyond that, you get back to the regional issues, some of which intersect with these seizures. You know, what about the Syrian conflict where mm. both the Iran and the U.S. is involved? What about Iraq? What about Yemen? In other words, I think the nuclear pawn off the chessboard is important. Mm -hmm. Then we get to these regional issues that will link politics and society and indeed the Internet. All right. Well, we have run out of time, so we're going to have to leave our conversation there. Thank you so much to all of our guests, Hamid Musavi, Courtney Raj, and Scott Lucas. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see this and all of our previous programs again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. 
from me, Mohammed Jamjoum, and the whole team here. Bye for now.